Thank you everyone for participating in our weekly on Bayan class. Uh, Shiraz Bhai will take us through uh, the Bakar today. Please, Shiraz Bhai, go ahead. everybody. Uh, today, we are going to study Surah Bakar. It's the second chapter, second Surah of Quran, and it's the longest Surah of Quran. It contains uh, 286 verses. The basic theme of this larger surah of Quran is to convey the message of Islam to Jews, number one, to remind them of the mistakes they made in the past, because of which the responsibility of taking the revelation of God, consuming it, and conveying its message to the rest of the world is given away to Bani Ismail, their cousins, uh, the Arabs. On top of that, the Surah talks to Muslims as well. It conveys them of their responsibility. It tells them that the responsibility God is handing over to you is a huge responsibility. It's also telling them how they can be successful in fulfilling this responsibility that God is going to give to them and what they should not be doing, uh, in other words, by not following the path of the Jews and not repeating the same mistakes that the previous generation made before them. It's a very interesting surah because it immediately starts at the Surah Fatiha. And Surah Fatiha is the opening of the Quran in that surah. We discussed in the last lecture that a person is praying to God and asking God for guidance. So immediately after that, why there is this chapter in Quran that's talking about Jews? I will answer that a bit later. But keep that question in mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this chapter in paragraphs. The style of communication would be that I'm not going to read out one verse and then, then explain that verse. I'm going to read out a set of verses. Let's call it a paragraph for now. And I'm going to explain the meaning of the entire paragraph collectively. So, in the name of God, the most gracious, the ever merciful. This is Surah Alif Lam Mim. This is the book of God. There is no doubt in it. This is guidance for among those who fear God, who are professing faith without beholding and are diligent in prayer, and are spending for our cause from what we have given them. And they are believing in what has been revealed to you and also in what has been revealed before you. And in reality, have, con have firm conviction in the hereafter. It is they who were guided from their law. It is they who shall succeed. I just read the first five verses of Surah Bakr. So these five verses collectively are telling us that there is absolutely no doubt that Quran is the word of God. So what does that mean? If there is no doubt that Quran is the word of God, is it going to give guidance to every person? or every person will be able to receive guidance from Quran. The Quran clarifies on this concept or question immediately, right in the beginning, that there is no doubt, this is the book of God, there is no doubt it's full of guidance, but what type of people will be able to receive that guidance from Quran? What kind of attitude they need to have to be able to receive guidance from Quran. So what are the things that Quran immediately mentioned? 
what are the qualities that we need to have in ourselves to be able to attain guidance from Pira? Number one, they are, they should be looked at in. People who fear God. Now here we are talking about people who have an understanding of God and they fear rejecting the message of God. If you don't have that fear in your heart, if you don't fear that on the day of judgment, you will be answerable to God, then you will feel free to reject or deny the message of God whenever it, it, it's not going to suit your cause. So if you don't like something and you simply reject it because you don't care that you will be answerable for it, then Quran won't be able to guide you. Quran is a guidance beyond doubt, but you won't be able to receive that guidance from Quran. You won't be able to get the benefits of the guidance of Quran. So the first quality that we need to have is, we need to fear God, number one. Number two, <clears throat> those people who profess faith without beholding and are diligent in prayers and are spending from what we have given them. The second quality that a person needs to have is that when it makes sense to believe in something then they shall believe in that thing. They should not have vanity in them that, okay, if you want me to believe in something, just show it to me right now. If something makes logical sense to you, then why don't you abide by what your conscious and what your intellect is telling you? If you're going to go against your intellect, then Quran won't be able to help you. So, believing in the gap, in the unseen, the word that is used in Quran, mostly for things that are, that we don't have any materialistic means to come across with, or to identify, or to figure out. For example, when God Quran tells us about angels, revelation, paradise, Hell. These are the things which we logically understand. Everything surrounds us point towards a God and point towards hereafter. But then, if for no good reason, just out of vanity, I say that I'm not going to believe in hereafter unless or until you show me paradise and hell right now, then Quran won't be able to guide you. So the First quality that the Quran is telling us is taqwa, fearing God, being conscious of God. If you don't have that, Quran won't be able to guide you. The second quality is not going by the evidence, not going by the intellect, but simply making demands that are unreasonable. If you're not going to believe things based upon intellect, and you're conscious and the evidence around you, and you're going to make unnecessary demands to believe in that thing and ignoring all the evidence, Quran won't be able to guide you. The next thing that the Quran tells us, uh, practically speaking, if a person is a muttaki, if a person believes in the bigger picture based upon the surrounding evidence, believes in the hereafter, then practically, what you see in their lives, what kind of actions they perform. Quran mentioned two things, salah, prayer, namaz, and spending money on other people, charity. So if you talk about your personal relationship with God, if you talk about act of worship, Slice their right, you know, at the top. Or we can put it this way, 
It's the foundation of everything. So, but naturally, a person who has submitted to God, who believe in God, who believe in the hereafter, you will find them by bowing down their head to God, Almighty God. They will offer prayers. So it doesn't mean that they are only going to offer prayers. Many times, a certain attitude is mentioned by, you know, the four fundamental actions or principles of their attitude. So they're going to offer prayer. It's one of the key qualities and attributes of a person who fears God and who respects the evidence and the logic that's been put in front of him. Number two, they spend their wealth on the poor and the needy. The wealth that the Quran has explicitly mentioned over here, the wealth that the God has given to them. So the person realizes that whatever riches I have, it's a blessing of God. It belongs to God. That person is grateful that God has given that person so much wealth and given them the liberty to spend it on themselves and their families. But at the same time, they feel the responsibility of spending it on the poor and the needy as well. So these are the two qualities that they're going to have. And if you have these type of qualities, then the guidance of Quran is for you. And it's actually, you know, impacting you in a positive manner. Furthermore, <clears throat> and they believe in what has been revealed to you. You means Prophet Muhammad, peace be. And also, what was revealed before you. Why is it such an important thing? Here, Again, Quran is talking about a certain type of attitude. That these people, they don't make any discrimination based upon race, family, nation. They believe in the truth. Irrespective of the fact that who is speaking the truth, whether it's somebody from another nation, somebody from another clan, Somebody who belongs to a community with which you don't have any good, particularly good terms with, it doesn't matter to them. As long as the message that's been conveyed, <coughs> I'm sorry, as long as the message that's been conveyed is the truth, and you realize that it is the truth, stick to it, accept it and say it in, in front of others that it is the truth. This is another quality that's been mentioned over here. Quality of whom? People who will be guided by Buddha. And they have firm conviction in the hereafter. In Urdu, we call it Yakin. They have firm conviction in the hereafter. They live their life and their actions show that they are living it with this very, very strong conviction that they will, there's going to be a day of judgment. And they will be answerable for every single deed that they ever going to put do on this planet. They will be answerable for every single action. So there are five things that are enlisted over here. Number one, people who will be guided by Quran, what kind of attributes they have. They, they believe in the gap. Generally translated as unseen, and it's the correct translation. But rea in reality, what it means is they believe in evidence, 
but they don't insist that unless or until you show us with from our very own eyes, we are not going to believe. It's an illogical demand. None of us has seen gravity, but we believe in it because of the overwhelming evidence of it. So they believe in that. They perform salah. They offer salah. They do charity, number three. They believe in this book, in this revelation, and they believe in the previous revelations as well. They don't make any discriminations based upon clan, culture, race, family, ethnicity. They abide by the truth, no matter where it comes from. And number five, they live with a strong conviction that there is going to be a day of judgment. And God is going to do justice. God is going to reward people who did righteous deeds. And God is going to punish people who did wrong deeds. So these are the five qualities that are mentioned right in the beginning of the Quran of people whom Quran is going to guide. So these the one type of people whom Quran is going to guide. The very next verse, verse number six and verse number seven of Surah Baqarah, they are going to tell us another category of people. They're going to tell us about another category of people whom Quran will never guide. The polar opposite of the category of people which we just discussed. The first category whom Quran is going to guide for sure. The second category, whom Quran is never going to guide, for sure. Let's see what category is that and what kind of qualities these people have. On the other hand, those who have decided to reject this book, it is the same to them, whether you want them or not. They will not believe you. Notice a very important thing over here. Decided to reject. It's not that the message is not making sense to them. It's not because whatever Quran is saying sounds illogical to them. That's not the reason. They are not rejecting the message for any legitimate reasons. They have decided to reject the message. They have pre-decided it. It doesn't matter what evidence you're gonna put in front of them, they are not going to accept it. They don't care about the truth. They have other things that, to worry about. They have other things on their agenda. So if a person has already decided that he or she is not going to listen to you or not going to listen to the message, not going to assess its truth, its validity, then it doesn't matter what, you, what you're what you gonna tell them. They won't pay heed to it. They won't be mindful about it because they have already decided to reject the message. So people, who has already decided to reject this book, it is the same to them whether you, here you means Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whether you warn them or not. Allah is telling Prophet Muhammad, doesn't matter how much effort you are going to put in, it won't be, do any benefit to such people. Now, just imagine, when Quran is telling this to Prophet Muhammad, where does any of us stand, nowhere. So a person who don't want to be guided, you can never, never, ever give guidance to it, that, that person. Only Allah gives guidance. We, just, we are just the tools, right? But nobody can give guidance to that person. And Allah is not going to 
एनफोर्स गाइडेंस अपॉन दैट पर्सन फोर्सफुली किसी को गाइडेंस नहीं दी जाए गॉड हैज नाउ सेट ए सील ऑन देयर हार्ट्स एंड ऑन देयर ईयर्स and on their eyes is a veil in arabic it's a description that their hearts are sealed their ears are sealed right here they hear not seen they see not in urdu we call it dekh kar andekha kar dena they are deaf dumb and blind in what sense that they hear the truth but it doesn't affect them their conscious their heart doesn't push them enough to go with the truth to abide by the truth to do what is right so it's a dead heart worthless non working eyes and ears so in the language of quran god says god has set a seal on their hearts Their hearts are closed, and on their ears, and on their eyes is a veil, and on the day of judgment, a great torment awaits them. Means that they will never get a chance; they will never be able to repent in this world. So far, we said, "Ehdena sirat al mustaqim" in Surah Fatir. Please, God, guide us to the straight path. immediately immediately in the very beginning of surah bakra the quran told us about two types of people two categories of people one to whom quran is going to give guidance for sure and the other category to whom quran will never guide ever for sure and no human being on the face of the planet or angel in the heavens or any other creature anywhere in this universe will be able to convince them or guide them because they are not looking for the truth they have decided they are not going to accept it and in this world we have a free will it's the perk of going through a test that god has given us free will so if somebody has decided they don't want to hear logic they don't want to hear the truth then doesn't matter which verse of quran you going to quote them doesn't matter what evidence you going to put in front of them it's all the same to them they will reject it they will say no to everything so far what i didn't tell you is that without naming the jews the quran is actually talking to the jews wait a minute how do you know this shiraz Let's keep reading and see if what I just said makes any sense. Otherwise, it's just a mere claim or statement of Shiraz that can be entirely wrong, right? So far, Quran didn't mean that I'm talking to the Jews, I'm talking to the Christians, I'm talking to whom. But Quran is talking to the Jews here, and we will see shortly why I think that to be the case. Now there is a third category of people. Uh, I love the start of Surah Bakara. I love the entire Surah Bakara. It's a very beautiful start. Right in the beginning, Quran is making crystal clear the type of attitude that we need to have for this book to be effective. If we don't have the right attitude, this book is not magically going to enforce guidance right in our hearts. No. it's not going to impose anything on us what is this third category just think over it the first category was the type of people who will get guidance from quran guaranteed the second category was the type of people who will never get guidance from quran guaranteed what could be the third possible type anybody wants to make a guess before we read the verses please go ahead unmute any guesses what is the third possibility left awaaz aa rahi hai 
जी जो बिल्कुल नहीं मानते और एक ये है कि जो मानते हैं थर्ड यही है कि जो दरमियान में रखा जाता है the third category is the category of people who don't want to outright reject the quran in front of other people right so so that they are slightly different from the second category who don't want to outright reject the quran just like the people in the second category were doing but they don't want to accept the quran they don't want to accept the truth just like the people in the first category were doing so they don't want to fall in either category they don't want to accept the truth whole heartedly number one but they don't want to outright reject it or go against it openly number two they want to be somewhere in between they want to find a middle ground beech ka rasta koi nikale pehle ki do categories jo bayan ki gayi the two categories from our lady explain this let's find a path somewhere in between how is that even possible either you accept islam or you don't accept islam what they tried to do was okay muhammad peace be upon him sallallahu alaihi wasallam we accept him to be a messenger quran is the word of god we are not going to outright reject it we are not going to say that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is making a mazal a false claim of prophet or Quran is not the word of God. Good for you guys. So go ahead and follow Prophet Muhammad. Read Quran. Make your lives better. But don't ask us to do the same. For us, our prophets, our books, the teachings of our ancestors are good enough. see we are not rejecting you we are not calling you a liar we are not saying that it's a false religion we are not saying that it's a false book of god we are not we are not saying any of that like the people in the second category we appreciate what you are doing for humanity so keep doing that but don't ask us to accept the truth because then the very next logical you know thing a person would say if you think that prophet muhammad is the prophet if you think that quran is the word of god then why are you not accepting islam why are you not accepting prophet muhammad then the response is for us our ancestors our clan our community the teachings of our scholars yeah we think it's good enough for us we will just just find in the hera this is the middle way Let's see what how Quran explains it and uh, what Quran says about it, whether it's acceptable or not, and whether Quran will be able to guide such people or not. About the first category, Quran explicitly said they will be guided for sure. About the second category, Quran explicitly said they will never be guided for sure. Let's see what Quran says about this third category and this third type of attitude that a human being can have. I'm talking in general terms, but here again, I'm repeating myself for the third time. Quran is talking to the Jews. of medina and among these people are who are those who say we have professed faith means wa min an-nasi man yaqulu amanna billahi wa bil yawm al-akhir we also believe in god we also believe in the hereafter so we have professed faith in god and in the last day isn't it the same teaching that quran is uh, teaching to people isn't it the same message that quran is conveying to the people believe in one god believe in the hereafter live your life knowing that you will be answerable to god in the hereafter we believe in all of that but in reality but in reality they do not have faith in anything so immediately the word hypocrites come to our mind okay 
Yes, they are hypocritical in their attitudes. But are we talking, is the Quran talking about hypocrites among the Muslims? Or is it talk still talking about Jews? Let's see. They want to deceive both God and the believers. The thing I said earlier, that they don't want to have any clash with the prophet or his community by outright rejecting them and calling them liars and calling it to be a false religion and a false book of God. They don't want to do any of that. But they don't want to believe like a normal believer, like a normal Muslim. So this is the middle way that they took. They want to deceive both God and the believers, but indeed they only deceive themselves. How come? So just because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not from Bani Israel, he's from Bani Ismail, from their cousins, from another branch of Prophet Ibrahim, descendant. They are going to reject him. They are rejecting him. They are not believing in him, despite knowing that he is a true prophet of God and Quran is the word of God. So what they're saying to everybody is we believe in God, which they did. We believe in the hereafter, which they did. But don't ask us for anything else. Don't demand us any further. Don't demand anything else from us. Don't put any further demands in front of us. Don't want it. Don't try to convince us to believe in Prophet Muhammad. Whatever we believe, whatever we abide by is good enough for us. Look at the wording of Quran. They want to deceive both God and the believers. Deceiving the believers, it makes sense. Deceiving God? Of course nobody can deceive God. That's why immediately the verse says, but indeed, they only deceive themselves. Because God knows everything. God knows their intentions. God knows whatever they're trying to put off here, put off over here on, in this situation. God knows everything. So they are deceiving nobody but themselves. And then the verse says, and realize it not. Means that they didn't think this through, that hypothetically, even if they were able to convince the Muslims and the prophet and everybody else around, they would never be able to convince God on the day of judgment. Their own hands, their own body parts are going to speak against them. They, our own body parts are going to become witness against us, as mentioned in Quran explicitly, on the day of judgment. And God is all-knowing. There's nothing we can think of. There's no plan or strategy we can create that will deceive God, may God forbid. But they're not realizing it. And this is what happens when your intellect is suppressed by your vanity. Aapka varur, aapka takabur, aapke non-ethical agendas, when they overtake your mind, this is exactly what happens. That you do things that are logically extremely stupid, trying to deceive God, as if anybody can do that. But you don't realize it. In other words, you don't think it through. Properly sustaining them. In their hearts was an ailment. Unke dilo me ek bimari hai. Yel fasan kurao. In their hearts was an ailment. Kya bimari? Quran didn't explain it over here. It's explained a few verses later. Jealousy. What was the ailment? What is the ailment Quran is referring to over here? In their heart was an ailment. Unke dilo mein bimari. Kis cheez ki bimari? Kis bimari ka zikar hai? It's not a physical illness. It's a moral illness. They are trying to, you know, pull this one off. They are trying to adapt this strategy of deceiving Muslims because 
They don't want to believe in Prophet Muhammad because they are jealous that if we admit openly that he's a prophet and also admit that it's a binding upon us to follow this person, then we won't be the kings anymore. We won't be the Ummat Avasta anymore. Bani Israel will be declared and authorized and sanctified by us as the new chosen people, selected community of God. We won't be the chosen ones anymore. They were jealous of us. That's the ailment in their heart. It's the sickness that was in their heart that Quran is talking about. And God now, now the verse says, after talking about the ailment, pointing towards the ailment, that jealousy, and God now has increased their ailment further. If you want to become a very righteous person, God is going to assist you in that. If you want to become a very bad person, God is going to assist you in that. That's how we are built. That's how our nature is built. That's the perk of a free will. We have free will. So if we want to become a very healthy person, if we start doing exercise, our body is going to become healthy. If we don't take care of ourselves, then our bodies will become weaker and weaker. We're going to get sick and sick. Likewise, if you want to become a very righteous person, we do righteous deeds and it gives us the capacity to do more righteous deeds. It, to put it simply, it increases our stamina to become more righteous. If we do one bad deed after the other, then it gives us the capability to do even more bad deeds. And because God has created our nature to be like this, God is pointing it towards himself that God now has increased their ailment because God is the designer and the creator of his nature. And because they have been lying. Whatever they are claiming in front of the Muslims and the Prophet, this is not the true reason. They are lying. The true reason is they don't want to believe in profit out of jealousy. The ailment in their heart. There is a grievous penalty for them, of course, in the hereafter. And when it is said to them, create not disorder in land. Don't create mischief in land. How they were creating mischief in land? We need to understand that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not a mere prophet. He was a messenger. What is the rule mentioned in Quran about all the messengers? That whenever God sends a messenger to a nation and that nation rejects, or a portion of that nation rejects the message of that messenger, God is not going to wait for the judgment day to pass a judgment on them. God is going to pass a judgment on them in this very world. They will be punished in this very world. So if these people who belong to this third category, who are trying to find a middle way, they are neither openly accepting the message of Quran nor openly rejecting it. They are find, trying to find a middle way, right? God is not going to accept this. And if God is not going to accept this, then once God ordained punishment for the direct audience of prophet, they will be punished. They're going to get killed or they will be subjugated. Isn't that creating mischief in land? When you know the truth, when you know the law, go by the truth and abide by the law. Why break the law and 
enforce the hand of the government to punish you for it. Why are you going to create mischief in land like that? This is exactly what the Quran is talking about here. When the Muslims tell them, please don't create mischief in land. Don't try to play a fast one, right? <laughs> on call. Don't try to be over smart. Accept the message of Islam. Accept the truth. Bow down your head to the Almighty. Otherwise, there will be mischief in life. You will be punished. They replied, we are only reformers. What does that even mean? See, there is a category of people who are outright rejecting you, who are calling you, you know, liars, who are declaring Islam to be a false religion and Quran to be a falsely claimed divine word of God. We are doing none of that. We, we want everybody to live in peace. Well, no, actually you don't. Because we are you are the direct audience of a messenger of God. And as a direct audience of a messenger of God, the day of judgment for you will start on this very world, on this very planet. You will either be rewarded for the good deeds and accepting the truth and striving in the way of the truth, or you will be punished for going against the truth on this very world, on this very planet. But they are not realizing. They consider themselves to be the reformers. Quran says, be aware. They are the one who creates disorder. They will be responsible for the disorder and the mischief in the land. They are not the reformers. Say. But they realize it not. Again, the Quran uses this term. They realize it not. We call it in Urdu, Bande ki mat mari Your capability to kind of rationalize things, it diminishes. Your vanity overtakes you. And when it is said to them, accept faith as these people before you. Why don't you accept when you say that you believe in God, when you say that you believe in the hereafter, and you are not rejecting Prophet Muhammad like the people in the second category, then why don't you just move one step further and accept the message of truth as it should be accepted? Look at their response. They say, shall we accept faith as these fools accepted faith? Then they declare Muslims to be the fools. Okay. Because they didn't have any better response. They didn't have any logical response. So this is the best they came up with. Listen. Now the Quran is telling us, listen, they themselves are fools, but they don't know. And when they meet the Muslims, they say, focus on this verse. And when they meet the Muslims, they say, we have accepted. We admitted in front of you that this is the book of God. He is the messenger. What else you want from us? We don't need him. We don't need this guidance. We have our own books. We have our own prophet. But we admitted it in front of you that he is a messenger. We are not re denying him or outright rejecting him. What else do you want from us? We have accepted the message. But when they reach their devil, their evil ones, means their leaders who were kind of running this plan behind the scenes, they say, we are with you. Do you notice? Don't worry about it. We say these things to the Muslims just to, you know, cool down the temperature, just to mitigate the situation, just to find a middle way. Don't worry. 
we are actually with you. We are not going to become true Muslims or actual Muslims or accept the Islam like the normal Muslim does. Don't worry about it. We are with you. We have always been with you. We just say this to the Muslims that we accept to be in their good books. We were only jesting, means we were only joking around with the Muslims. हम तो उनसे मजाक कर रहे थे सी मजाक में बंदे ने कह दिया आप आप नाराज क्यों हैं हम कुछ सीरियसली नहीं उनकी बात मानते बस उनको कह देते हैं सिचुएशन ठीक करने के लिए प्लीज काम डाउन नाराज मत हो आप जस्ट मींस वर्ड टू जोक कुरान से गॉड जस्ट विद देम गॉड इज जोकिंग विद देम व्हाई गॉड इज ऑब्जर्विंग ऑल ऑफ दिस and not punishing them immediately so but naturally a person thinks that their plan is actually working your plan is actually working it's succeeding right it's going to work and they're going to get the desired results no they won't god is observing every in our language what we say ki abhi aapki rassi daraz hai God is giving you more time, either to revert, change your attitude, or do as many sins as you want. But when the time comes, and God is going to put a firm, firm grip on you, means God decide to punish you, then there won't be any respite. You won't get more time. You won't get any more chance to repent or make any corrections. So this is Quranic way of saying no. You are not joking with Muslims. God is joking with you. And God just with them, and according to His law, gives them respite in their arrogance, such that they are wandering about. So earlier on, God mentioned they have an ailment in their heart. Now God is mentioning that this behavior is because of what arrogance. Now you can draw the connection. It's because of this arrogance, because of this jealousy. They are not believing in Islam as they should be. It is they who have given preference to error over guidance. Clearly, Quran is saying they preferred wrong path over the right path. They knew both paths, and they preferred the wrong one over the right one, out of arrogance, out of jealousy. So their deal has yielded absolutely no profit for them. This decision is not going to benefit them. and neither have they been able to find a way out they're not going to find a way out of this because god is observing them closely and god is going to deal with them as they should be dealt with i'm going to stop here i wasn't able to go through as many verses as i was planning to originally but so far we have covered the first 16 verses of surah bakara so the last 4 5 minutes we have if there are any questions please feel free to ask thank you very much assalam alaikum awaaz aa rahi hai bhai ji भाई ये जो आयत है तुम इस सरजमीन में फिसाद पैदा ना करो तो जवाब में कहते हैं हम ही इसलाह करने वाले इसको जरा दोबारा से एक्सप्लेन कीजिएगा ओके पहली बात ये समझे कि वो उनको ये क्यों कहा जा रहा है कि वो जमीन में फसाद पैदा कर उनके जवाब को भी बाद में डिस्कस कर पहले आप अपनी अंडरस्टैंडिंग बताएं कि ये क्यों कहा जा रहा है उनको कि जमीन में फसाद का मचाओ 
یہی مجھے ایک اصل میں کنفیوژن ہی یہ ہے کہ جو ان کا رول ہے وہ اصل میں ایک درمیان کا راستہ کرانے والا ہے جو نہ بالکل لڑائی چاہتے اور جو نہ ایمان لانا چاہتے ہیں تو یہی کنفیوژن ہے کہ پھر ان کو یہ کیوں کہا جا رہا ہے فساد پیدا نہیں بالکل صحیح میں نے پہلے اسی کا جواب دینے کی کوشش کی کہ جب خدا کا رسول اس دنیا میں آتا ہے تو لوگوں کی دو ہی کیٹیگریز ہو سکتی ایک جو ان پر ایمان لائیں گے دوسرے جو ایمان نہیں لائیں گے جو ایمان لائیں گے ان کو اللہ اس دنیا میں ترقی دے گا دے ول بی ریبارڈ ان دس ورلڈ اینڈ ہیئر آفٹر ان دیئر ان شاء اللہ جو ایمان نہیں لائیں گے ان کے ساتھ کیا سلوک ہوگا ان کا فیصلہ اسی دنیا میں ہو جائے گا اور وہ فیصلے کے نتیجے میں کیا ہوگا وہ مٹا دیے جائیں گے ڈیتھ کی پنشمنٹ ڈیتھ ڈیتھ پنشمنٹ اف دے آر ناٹ مونوتھیسٹ اگر وہ تحیر کے ماننے والے نہیں ہیں تو دے ول بی وائپڈ آؤٹ اور اگر وہ توحید کے ماننے والے ہیں لیکن رسول کو نہیں مانگے تو دے ول بی سب جگیٹ آپ کے ماہ تحت آ جائیں گے یہ بات آپ کو پتا ہے رسالت کے قانون کے بارے میں جب کوئی رسول کو نہیں مانے گا تو ان دونوں میں سے جو بھی کام کرنا ہے وہ کام کرنے کے لیے کیا ہوگا جنگ ہوگی تو آپ جنگ کو کس لفظ سے تعبیر کریں گے جب خدا کی مخلوق میں لوگ مریں گے تو آپ ان کو کن الفاظ سے تعبیر کریں گے بے شک اور گریٹر گڈ کے لیے ہی کر رہے ہوں لوگوں کے بچے قتل ہوں گے لوگ اپنی جانوں سے جائیں گے تو آپ اگر درد دل رکھنے والے بندے ہیں تو آپ یہی کہیں گے کہ یہ زمین میں پھنسا دیا یہ کیا ہے تو جب ایک ایسی کیٹیگری لوگوں کی ہوگی جو رسول کا میسج ڈاج کرنے کی کوشش کر رہے ہیں لیکن وہ کر نہیں سکتے کیونکہ خدا یہ ساری ایکٹیویٹی مانیٹر کر رہا ہے اور خدا کے ڈائریکٹ وہی رسول پہ آتی ہے تو رسول از انڈر دا پروڈکشن اینڈ گائیڈنس آف گاڈ تو یہ ممکن نہیں ہے تو جب یہ ممکن نہیں ہے تو ان کی یہ فلیشیس اسٹریٹجی یہ غلط تدبیر کام نہیں کرے گی جب یہ کام نہیں کرے گی تو ان کے لیے سزا کا فیصلہ دیر سویر آ جائے گا جب ان کے لیے سزا کا فیصلہ آئے گا تو اس کے بعد زمین میں فساد ہی مچے گا لوگ قتل ہی ہوں گے یا غلام بنا لیے جائیں گے اردو کا ورڈ جو میں سب جوگیشن کہہ رہا ہوں اس کو کیا کہوں محکوم محکومی کی زندگی گزارنی پڑے گی ان کو یہ کوئی اچھی بات ہے تو نہیں ہے تو جب قرآن کہہ رہا ہے اور آپ کو وہ بات سمجھ آتی ہے اور آپ کو آپ اپنے منہ سے کہتے ہیں وی بلیو آپ صحیح کہہ رہے ہیں ہم آپ کی بات مانتے ہیں تو پھر سیدھے طریقے سے اللہ کی بات مان کیوں نہیں لیتے جب بات کو صحیح کہہ رہے ہو تاکہ یہ سب کچھ نہ ہو قتل و غارت نہ ہو مخلوق اللہ کی مت مرے اس کے عذاب کے نیچے نہ آئے ڈز اٹ میک سینس نا کہ زمین میں فساد مت پہنچاؤ اب ان کے جو آپ پہ آ جائیں سوری آئی ون جسٹ تھرٹی مور سیکنڈ اب جواب کیا ہے دے آر ناٹ فوکسنگ آن دا کانسیکوینسز دے آر فوکسنگ آن واٹ کیونکہ اگر نتیجے پہ ان کی مطلب دھیان دے تو پھر تو ان کو یہ عقل کرنی چاہیے کہ وہ خدا کو تو دھوکہ دے نہیں سکتے جو قرآن نے کہا کہ اللہ کو اور مسلمانوں کو دھوکہ دینا چاہ رہے ہیں لیکن دھوکہ کس کو دے رہے ہیں خود کو تو یہ تو ممکن نہیں ہے نا کہ خدا کو آپ دھوکہ دے دیں اور مسلمانوں کو کیوں نہیں دے سکتے کیونکہ اس ٹائم رسول مسلمانوں کے بیچ میں موسوم ہے رسول پہ اللہ کی بہی آتی ہے اللہ سب کچھ جانتا ہے تو اگر وہ کہیں مسلمانوں کو دھوکہ دینے کی کوشش کریں گے تو اللہ وہی کے ذریعے رسول کو بتا دے گا رسول مسلمانوں کو بتا دیں گے تو رسول کی موجودگی میں تو یہ ممکن نہیں تو ان کا اینڈ ریزلٹ پہ فوکس نہیں وہ فی الحال آج کے دن سچویشن کے حساب سے کوئی بیچ کی راہ نکالنا چاہ رہے ہیں کہ کسی طرح ابھی ٹائم نکال دو جان بچ جائے ہم وہ کہتے ہیں جی ہم تو وی آر ٹو وی آر ریفارمرس ہم تو اصلاح کرنے کی کوشش کر رہے ہیں کہ 
लड़ाई झगड़ा ना हो तुम्हारी नीयत तो ये है तो बस थोड़ा आप भी नरमी दिखाएं थोड़ा हम दूसरी साइड से भी बात करते हैं तो हर कोई बस खुश रहे आपस में जो जिसको सही लगता है वो करे विच इज ट्रू बाय द वे आप और मैं आज के दिन यही करेंगे लेकिन रसूल की मौजूदगी में इट्स नॉट एप्लीकेबल रसूल की मौजूदगी में तो खुदा का कानून नाफिज हो तो मुसलमानों की बात सुन के वो क्या कहेंगे आगे से आप बिल्कुल सही कह रहे हैं हम फसा भी लोग हैं <laughs> ये, ये कौन कहता है <laughs> <laughs> Even if you hear the recordings of terrorists in today's world, वो वो कहते हैं हम terrorists हैं हम फसादी हैं, वो कहते हैं we are reformers, हर कोई reformer ही होता है अपने लिए। So I, I hope that answers the question. But it's a good question. Thank you, thank you, Jazaakum. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great lecture. Uh, Inshallah, we'll uh, meet up again next Saturday, same time. And uh, wonderful day, everyone. Assalamualaikum. Thank you everybody. Salam.